Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Timothy this morning. Come on in if you're out front. It is time to get rolling today. I have good news today. We are here gathered in this place. And here at Timothy, one of our goals is, one of our focus is to transform lives through Christ. And one of the ways that happens is through our time in worship. This is not something amazing and incredible we're going to do. It's all about what our God is going to do today as he meets us and proclaims the good news to us today. And as he feeds us at his table today, our lives will be transformed because God is in this place. Amen? All right, we're already on top of things. Good. Well, my name is Ryan. I am one of the pastors here at Timothy, and it's a joy and an honor to lead you in worship today with these amazing singers and musicians behind me, as we'll lead you in song and scripture reading and so much more. And we're glad you're here today. If you're a guest today, uh, we're just thankful that you've come to join your voices with us, to hear God's word with us, and to be a part of our family today. And so with that, before we get going with all the stuff we want to talk about here this morning in our service, I want to invite you just to rise and just greet those around you. Take a moment to do that. Give a high five, a fist bump, an elbow, a wave across the room. It's amazing stuff. Good morning, all. I already said good morning to all of you. There's no one back there today. All right, as you make your way back to your seats, we got some things we want to throw out to you today just to get you ready. The first thing is, the first thing is we want to, we want to invite you to let us know that you're here to worship with us today. Uh, while I have a pretty good memory, I don't know all of you by name, first name and last, and I'm certainly not going to come around and count you. So it'd be great if you let us know you're here to worship with us today. A couple ways you can do that. You can pull out the Timothy Lutheran app, go into the giving section, special. There's a place to say, hey, I'm here. I'm here with you all today. Uh, or there's a card in your little pamphlet you got on the way in, bulletin you got in, or in the seat back in front of you. You can just fill that out. Let us know you are here to worship with us today. That'd be amazing. That helps us with various different things. And so uh, that'd be great. Along with that, though, on the back of that card or on our website, there's a place for prayer requests. If there's something stirring or coming in your life that you would like to receive prayer for, to celebrate alongside you, or if there's something going on that's kind of left you uncertain, then we'd love to pray alongside. There's two ways, again, to do that on those sites or in the card, and you can put that card into our offering plate today if you want it just to go to our prayer team. But if you want it to be incorporated into our time of worship today, then I invite you to hang on to that. During the offering time, I'll come around and you can hold that up and wave it around and I will grab that from you. And we will incorporate into our corporate prayers today as we pray over that during our time in worship today. All right, so that's, that's going on there. Also this morning, if you are one of our guests, we have a gift for you. Uh, we call it a love book. It's got a devotional. It's got a little bit of information. Our elders, ushers are coming through right now. If you are a guest and you, you'd like that, you'd like a little information, there they are. Um, if you don't want to wave your hand in front of everybody and let them know you're a guest today, you can catch those two gentlemen a little bit later or myself and we can get you hooked up with one of those. Um, it, we, we just want it to be a blessing for you uh, more than anything else. And also this morning, we want to give you announcements of kind, of kind of some stuff that's stirring in the works here at Timothy. The first is, with fall season upon us, school is starting, and so is our midweek ministries. One of those is Crosswalk and Faith Roots. Faith Roots is our Sunday ministry, but Crosswalk is our midweek um, event for kiddos pre-K through fifth grade. We also have confirmation. We also have senior high. But for this... Um, Crosswalks coming up on September 7th will be our first opportunity to get together. 
This is our chance for our, our kids to have an interactive opportunity in the middle of the week, a little bit of singing, a, a little bit of growing, hearing some stories, snacks, because if you don't have snacks, you might as well not have anything, right? And uh, our kiddos have a chance to learn and grow in their faith in the middle of that week. Gives parents a chance to get connected in, in different ministries as well, or if you just need to run errands, it's a great time to do that too. So we really encourage you to go online and pre-register your kiddos so we can plan for that this year. Again, pre-K through fifth grade on Wednesday night. Even if they can't come every Wednesday, we love for them to pre-register so that we know they're coming and we can be prepared for them. Go on to our website, Children's Ministry, and that's where you're going to find that. Along with that, in Crosswalk, we have Faith Roots going on, and we're in need of some assistance and teachers in both of these, although here we're good. But if you're interested in being at the North Side and helping with Sunday School or Faith Roots or Crosswalk, we're still looking for some helpers. What does that mean? Well, that means what we do, what we do as a staff is we put all the resources together, we get all the activities is ready. So all you have to do is, is prep a little bit of reading and then show up and be a part of the part of the fun and a part of the teaching. You can be an assistant. You can be a leader. Uh, you can volunteer, donate snacks. There's all kinds of different ways, similar to VBS in a lot of ways. And so we'd love for you to get involved in that also. All right. So moving on from that, then we have Timmy Burger time. Who doesn't love a good Timmy Burger? Any Timmy Burger lovers in here? Okay, woohoo. All right, like, you know, get them while they're hot. Get six or seven of them for yourself. It's fine. It's coming up at the Fall Fun Fest here in Blue Springs. We have a brief announcement. We always need help. It really is a church-wide event, and it is a lot of fun. So even if you can come work a couple hour shift, um, you're going to get to know some people, and you're going to have a good time doing it. Set up, tear down. You can even, if you like to cry, there's an opportunity to cut onions. So it's all available for you. Take a watch. Hi, I'm Becky Blatt, and I'm on the Timothy Lutheran Steak Burger Committee. And there's about 23 of us. We are looking for 300 plus volunteers to make this year the best year ever as we're celebrating 40 years in our community. So come be a part of the amazing fun that we have at the Fall Fun Fest. It raised over $500,000 in the last 40 years, which is absolutely amazing that we've used to help the church in multiple ways that so we go above and beyond. And it only happens with amazing volunteers such as yourself. So please find us in the, in the lobby and or use the QR code this year and sign up with us today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. So they got a little information there. Again, if there's any way you can help, I know there's a lot of excuses and I know there's a lot of things we're busy with. But it is a really fun, and as she said, 300 volunteers. We need 300 of you, so I'll be taking names later. That's really why I have you fill out the communication cards. I'm going to call you and sign you up. Uh, just kidding. We're not going to do that. And lastly, just an update. If any of you worship at our Artie Mice campus, for six months we had uh, an 8 a.m. service and a 9.15 service up there. And the elders have decided... That that uh, in order to maintain our health as a congregation and to utilize our volunteers and to draw our congregation together, we are going to be dropping that 8 a.m. service, okay? And so we're going to be moving back to 9 a.m. worship at our RD Mice campus and then our 10 a.m. worship here. And so that's going to be helpful for the pastors and all the volunteers we have there. So if you, you are an RD Mice uh, worshiper at times, just take note of that. That's going to start on September 11th. September 11th, we'll have 9 a.m. up there. And again, nothing changes down here at our 10 a.m. service. So those are all our exciting and thrilling announcements. I want to invite you then at this time to please rise as we receive the invocation and begin our time of worship. Our time today is going to be focused on this weird text from Matthew we're going to hear in just a moment about the road um, that leads to life is narrow. And we don't like that because we don't like people being excluded. We don't like the idea that there's some people who aren't just going to be able to enter into the kingdom of God however they want, but that Jesus leads us. And that this is an important thing for us to talk about as we take serious the word of God. So Pastor John will be down in just a little bit to get us going in that and unpack that for us. So we begin this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's worship this morning.
service today, I invite you to be seated. As we draw near today in God's Word, He is the one who makes a way for us. And, and one of the interesting things I think about our reading this morning from Isaiah is so often we think of the Old Testament being sort of this heavy and challenging stuff. In the New Testament, that's the good stuff. And yet we hear a beautiful promise here in Isaiah 66 that we tune our ears into that while there is only one way to get to Jesus, there is only one way to eternal life, God gives us this beautiful picture of how he draws all people to himself. A reading then this morning from Isaiah 66 starting at the 18th verse. And I, because of what they have planned and done, am about to come and gather the people of all nations and languages and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them and I will send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and the Lydians, to Tubal and Greece, and to the distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations and they will bring all your people from all the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and wagons and on mules and camels, says the Lord. They will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonial clean vessels. And I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord, as a new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord. So will your name and your descendants endure from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson then comes, I think I said Matthew earlier, comes from Luke today. And we will hear this conversation among Jesus with the question asked, who then will be saved? Lord, are only a few. And so we hear Jesus' answer to that. And so I encourage you, open your ears and may the Holy Spirit open our hearts to hear these words and to wrestle with these things that our Lord says this morning. Chapter 13, starting at the 22nd verse. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Some asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and we drank with you and we taught in, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you came from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west, north and south, and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last, who will be first, and the first who will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Now, these are very serious things, Jesus says. Things worth contemplating, things worth wrestling with. And the reality is if, if we stop and take a look at our own lives today, we're going to see some things that we're not proud of. We're going to see some ugly things. We're going to see some things that may make us wonder, is this going to prevent me from getting into the kingdom of God or from being a part of the kingdom? 
kingdom of God. And as we contemplate those things today, Jesus invites us to come to him, to confess those things to him because he has good things and good promises for us. And so I invite you to join with me today as we confess our sins before our heavenly Father who is gracious and merciful. Please join me. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful, Church, hear these words today because they're for you. Upon this, your confession, I announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen that church that's the good news we hear that's the message that transforms us into the people of God and so may we sing God's praises as we join together in song I invite you to please rise as we sing this morning Bring new wine. 
That is our prayer, and our God answers that prayer by saying, I will. We take a moment now in our time together to confess and profess our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. This gives us an opportunity to, to remind one another to be a community of faith that stands together on this confession, and to be a church that declares this to the world, the faithfulness of our God. I invite you to join with me to confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed today. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, and in all on earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Yes, we confess that as the church, God's people. And as we confess that, the Lord invites us then to His table to receive His body and His blood. But as we prepare ourselves to come to the table of the Lord, to not just hear that we're forgiven, but to taste and see the forgiveness of God for each of us, we are encouraged in Scripture to examine ourselves, to, to consider our sin, to consider our faith, to consider our confession. I'm going to ask these four questions here in just a moment. As you hear those questions, I invite you to, to contemplate them with me and to respond and if you believe these, if you confess these with us, I invite you to respond with the word yes in each case. Do you acknowledge that you are a sinner? Yes. yes. Do you believe that Jesus is your personal Savior? Yes. Do you recognize the true body and blood of Jesus present in with the bread and wine, which is given and shed for you. Yes. And do you believe that through this meal, God will strengthen your faith to amend your life? Yes. If you've been uh, taught, if, you, if you've heard these things before, and if you've answered yes, then we welcome you to come to the table of the Lord. If you're still not sure where you're at and what you believe and what you confess, that's okay. We're glad you're here to worship with us because God is at work. Um, but if that's you today and you, you, you don't necessarily know if you believe this thing yet, this gift yet, you can, you're welcome to come forward and receive a blessing. Just let myself and the elders know you're just there for the blessing. So what we do for our young children and our, even our older ad uh, uh, young adults who haven't been trained in, in communion, we'll send a blessing to them. Or you can stay in your seat and just worship. But for those who are here to receive 
and desire to receive and confess alongside of us, we welcome you to the table of the Lord. Please be seated. As we gather around this meal, we hear God's words himself and God's promises himself that on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took the bread. After breaking it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, then after supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and he said, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Drink this as often as you remember me. Come receive God's gifts. Come receive God's peace. Come to the table.
peace and that joy. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, Jesus, to die and rise, that we might be delivered from eternal death. We give you thanks for the peace which we receive in this holy meal. Strengthen us in faith towards you and in love towards each other until we celebrate the feast of victory with Jesus when he comes again in glory. 
It's in his name we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to invite our kiddos. I don't need to say anything more. No. Uh, Faith Faith Roots is uh, heading out the back door. If you're a guest here today, have children with you. Um, This is a chance for our kiddos to learn during this period of time to to grow in an area and in a way just for them. We've got teachers back there. If you want to walk your kids back there, that's great. Uh, or they can head out. A lot of them know the way. You'll be picking them up then in that hallway over there after service. Just check in with an elder, usher, or myself, and we'll direct you where you need to go if you're, again, if you're a guest today and haven't done this before. Or your kiddos can stay with you. We love that too. And also in this time, we're going to gather our tithes and offerings. Just a reminder, if you have a prayer request you want incorporated into our service today, uh, keep that. I will walk by and give my attention if you can and hand that to me. Let's join together now as we worship God through our gifts, through our offerings, and through our song of praise.
of the incredible things we get to do when we gather in a place like this is we get to have corporate prayer, meaning we get to collectively lift up before our God the prayers of the people and the prayers of the church. And so we get to do that this morning, and this is especially significant because we're moving our way into a year of prayer. If you haven't noticed our signs out front or out there, on September 11th, we're going to be beginning a series called a Pray Without Ceasing. We want to be a church that prays and seeks God in everything and in all things. And so we do that this morning as we join together in prayer. There's a couple of prayer requests that have been given to me today. Uh, we have a prayer request for an individual who's struggling and fighting an alcohol dependency. And so we pray that, that the Lord would break those chains and create freedom there for that individual. We ask for prayers, there's been prayers asked for rather, uh, Justin and Brooke, Brooke Cooper and the family as a whole, as they suddenly lost Justin's sister. We also have a prayer of continual prayers rather for Ishelle Smead. We prayed for her last week. She was officially diagnosed with stage three breast cancer this past week. And so we pray for prayer. We ask the Lord to be with the family and with her as she begins this journey and all the questions and things that are still being unfolded in this. If you happen to know any of these individuals, we invite you to reach out, extend a hand of care, a phone call, a card, whatever it may be, as we love one another as Christ has loved us. I will wrap up each petition today with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and to which I invite you to respond, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Please rise as we come before the Lord. Lord, help us to enter by the narrow door. So many people fool themselves into thinking there are many ways into your kingdom, but Jesus tells us that only he is the way. Help us to not trust in our own good works or lean on our own understanding, but to cling to your radical and undeserved grace. May we hold on to the forgiveness that is ours in your son's death and resurrection every day. Lord, in your mercy, as we journey through this life, we know that we will experience both blessings and hardships. We are so thankful that you travel with us through them. We thank you for those times times you have answered our prayers in the past and provided us with so many abundant blessings. Lord, we lift those things up to you as in joy we give thanks for even the daily means in which you provide for us. But Lord, we also pray that you would be with those who are in need of your loving care in this time now. Today we lift before you Ishal Smeed as she continues this journey dealing and facing cancer. We pray for an individual dealing with alcohol dependence. We pray for freedom. We also pray for the Cooper family as they mourn the death of Justin's sister. Grant them peace. Grant them strength. Grant them hope in these times of darkness. A hope that only can be found in you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you call on all of us to use our special talents and abilities you have given to us to serve you in our daily lives. Help us to recognize those gifts you have given and help us to see the opportunities around us for service. As we use those special gifts, grant us joy in helping our neighbors because we know that in doing so, we are serving you as well. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the men and women who work within our congregation in leadership positions. Today we lift before you the members of Timothy's executive board and pray for you to grant them wisdom and direction. As they discuss future directions and exciting possibilities, help them to see clearly where you are guiding us as a congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you continue to feed our faith through word and sacrament. We have received Christ's body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine of Holy Communion, which not only gives us forgiveness of sins, but strengthens our faith for the days ahead. Continue to fuel our faith as we hear your word proclaimed. And as we gather in your name, 
we come to you praying the words that you yourself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So I thought we would do a little thought experiment today. We would sort of say, what if? What if we were to go out someplace public, we'll say downtown Kansas City, maybe somewhere a little closer to home, and we're going to conduct a survey? Doesn't that sound like fun, stopping strangers on the street and asking their opinion about stuff? Some of you are looking very skeptical right now about doing something like that, right? Well, thankfully, we don't need to do this as a thought experiment because the questions that we're going to ask in this hypothetical survey are questions that other groups have asked. For example, the Barna Group is a research uh, uh, organization that conducts these kinds of surveys about how Americans live out their faith, what they believe, all that kind of stuff. They've done this stuff for years. So what would the questions on this survey be? Well, here's question number one. Do you believe in heaven and hell? Do you believe that this exists? How do you think people would respond in our hypothetical survey? What do you think that they would say? Yeah, we're saying not so sure, maybe, yes, no. Well, in the Barna survey that they conducted a few years ago, they discovered that about 75%, three quarters of people surveyed said, yes, I believe that heaven exists. And interestingly, 70% said they believe that hell exists. A little bit lower, but almost the same number. So the vast majority of people in this survey said, yes, we believe that there is an afterlife, a good place and a bad place, right? So the second question that, they, that we'll ask is this. Where do you think you're going? Which one are you going to wind up in? How do you think people are going to answer this one? Most of them will say what? Heaven baby, right? Do you think anybody would say the other one? Well, here's the thing. Barna's study revealed that half of 1% of people said that they were definitely going to hell. I don't know why you would claim that out loud, but there you go. And about two-thirds of people said, I'm definitely going to heaven. One-third approximately wasn't so sure. Now we come to the last question. Why? Why are you going to wind up where you're going? And here's the sad thing. One third of the people in that survey that Barna took said, I have no idea. They believe that heaven exists. They probably believe they were going there. They did not know why they would wind up there at all, but they were pretty sure they would be. The rest of the responses ran the gamut of reasons most of it boiling down to, I'm a good person. I do the right things, I'm a good person, so therefore I will go to heaven. And that's something that we see repeated a lot in our world, right? This idea that if you want to go to heaven, you have to do enough good. As a matter of fact, that's something that I encountered recently uh, just a couple weeks ago, my wife and I decided that we were going to binge watch The Good Place on Netflix again. How many of you have seen the show? Few of you. This is a hilarious show. I love it. The theology is awful, though. It is horrible. As a Christian pastor, I say I love laughing at this show, but I hate the fact that it's so funny. Because what does it teach? 
if you want to get into the good place, you have to do enough good. You have to do good deeds and earn points, and if you get enough points, then you go to heaven. And if you don't get enough points, you wind up in the bad place. And as funny as this show is, what they're teaching is no joke because that's the way that a lot of people think that it works. This is what surveys say time after time after time. You ask someone, how are you going to get into heaven? And their response is, because of what I do. Because of how good I am. Now this is not a new question. These kind of surveys have been asked for centuries. As a matter of fact, we heard one in the gospel lesson for today. Jesus is traveling along and somebody stops him with a quick survey question and that question is, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Now this wasn't a Barna survey. They didn't exist back then. It could be that the person who asked Jesus this question was, you know, curious. Jesus, I was doing my Bible study this morning, and I came across some verses that I didn't totally get, and so I need to ask you, what's the right answer to this question? Or maybe, maybe there's a more personal reason for them asking. They're asking for a loved one, or maybe they're asking for themselves. God, am I going to be part of that crowd. Whatever the motivation, I'm sure that the person who asked this question was hoping that Jesus would look at him and say, oh, you're fine. You're good, baby. You're good. There's going to be, it's huge. It's going to be a party, man. Everybody gets in. No cover. And you know what does Jesus do? He doesn't leave it hypothetical. He doesn't talk in generalities. No, he speaks directly to the person asking the question and also to us. And he says, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Ooh. There's a guest list. And a bouncer, apparently. Is your name on the list? Jesus says, don't be so sure. Because there are going to be people who think they should be able to get in, but won't. And that's a little disconcerting, right? I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that everybody here is sitting here going, yeah, I'm in. I know I'm in. But hearing this, how many of you go, ooh, this doesn't make me feel all that secure right now, Pastor John? So what do we do when we feel that insecurity, when we feel that uncertainty? Well, what do we turn to and what do we point to to answer the question, why? Why are you getting in? Back in the first century, in Jesus' day and age, the Jewish people had come up with a whole list of reasons why they were going to get in. For example, they said, we come from the right family tree. We have Abraham as our ancestor. We are his children, and that counts for something. Or they said, you know what? We are going to get in because we believe the right things and we do the right thing. We do enough good, we are good people, therefore we are going to get into God's kingdom. And Jesus' answer here says, are you sure that's how it works? And that's something that we have to hear as well, because we sometimes are tempted to point to the same thing. We point to our family trees. We say, I come from a good Christian family. My parents, my grandparents, stretching back generations. Of course I'm a Christian. I was born that way. Or you hear some people say things like, well, you know what? I'm going to get in because of my spouse. They take care of the religion stuff, and I'm going to sneak in on their coattails. 
or for a lot of people, they point to what they do, right? I'm a good person because I've never cheated on my taxes. I'm a good employee, a good neighbor, a good family man. I do the right things. I watch what I say. I hold the door open for people. I am good more than I'm bad. Therefore, that has to count for something. And even if right now you're thinking in the back of your mind, I know that's not how it works, even good Christians start to think that way. I get up, I come to church almost every week. That has to count for something. When I heard the plea for Faith Roots volunteers or Crosswalk volunteers, and I heard the implicit threat from Pastor Ryan, call him before he calls you, I said, well, I'll sign up. That's going to count for double, right, Pastor Ryan? Totally. Triple, oh, triple, you heard it right there, gospel truth. (laughs) But that's how we think, isn't it? It really is by what we do. And that's why we need to hear what Jesus says. Because far too often, people rely on themselves and they have certainty for the wrong reasons. And what are they going to hear? Well, Jesus tells us. The door will one day be shut and people will be knocking, not knocking, pounding against it, saying, Lord, let us in. We ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. Jesus, you know us. And how will Jesus respond? I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you evildoers. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? This is so uplifting and so reassuring. And actually, it is. Believe it or not, the narrow door is a great message of grace if you dig down deep enough into it. And here's the reason why. What does the narrow door tell us? It tells us we can't rely on ourselves. Instead, we have to rely on the door itself. What does that mean? Well, Jesus tells us what the door is in John's Gospel. When he says, I am the gate, whoever enters through me will be saved. Jesus himself is the narrow door that opens the way into the kingdom of heaven. He puts it like this later on in John's gospel. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except how? Through me. And this is good news. Because think about it this way. If it really were up to you, could you ever know for sure that you had done enough? Could you ever know for sure that you hadn't disqualified yourself with some sinful act? You wouldn't ever know for sure. That's the problem. But because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, because he is the narrow door, the way into the kingdom of heaven, I don't have to question it. That door was opened through Jesus' death and resurrection. He pours out his life for me. And and not just me, you too, all of you. Because he does that, we can know with absolute certainty that yes, the door is open, and yes, I can walk through because of what God has done for me in Christ. That gives me assurance. And that's why we're told to leave off all of that other stuff. A lot of times people think that's too easy, and so they try to go, it's Jesus and something. It's Jesus and this and that. And eventually, whatever the and is grows bigger than Jesus. And that's how we get stuck. I think the reason why Jesus uses the imagery of a narrow door is to say you go through on your own. 
without the and. It's like a really cute video I saw this week. Just bear with me. It'll make sense, I promise. There's a video of a little puppy that was being released into a backyard with its older pup dog siblings. Right? And this backyard had a wrought iron fence. And this was a problem because the gaps in the fence were wider than the puppy. And so if the puppy got set out on its own, guess what it would do? Jump through the fence and it's gone. Well, the owners were smart enough to do something clever. What did they do? They put a harness on the puppy and then put a wooden spoon through the harness. So this little puppy saw a hole in the fence and ran for the hole, got its head through the fence, and that's when the spoon hit the fence. (laughs) And it was stuck. And so what did it do? It backed up looked at the next hole over, went over to the next hole, and tried to go through, and it got stuck. Over and over again, getting stuck because it was carrying that spoon. What was cute for the puppy is what the problem is with the narrow door for us. We try to carry anything else through the narrow door, what's gonna happen? We're gonna get stuck. That's why we rely on Christ alone. Because he is the way. He is... Oh, my clicker went dead. Awesome! Next slide, please. (laughs) He is the narrow door. He is the way into the kingdom of heaven. And if we're ever thinking that it's too cheap, or there has to be more, there has to be some hidden cost that we're not aware of, well, I've got a story for you. The story is this. There was once a pastor who worked with minors. And when I say minors, I don't mean children. I mean people who go into mines. Next slide. (laughs) And as he was talking with one of these miners, he encountered somebody who had a hard time trusting that he had been saved because it was too cheap. It was too easy. He said, there's got to be more. There's got to be a cost. And so the pastor thought about it, and he said, my friend, have you been to work today? And the miner said, yeah, pastor, I put in a full shift down at the mine. He said, okay. How did you get down into the mine to do your work? And he said, well, I rode the lift. You know, the big big industrial elevator in the middle of the mine with the winches and the cables that lower the men up and down so that they can get to their job. And he said, how much did it cost you to ride that lift? The miner looked a little bit surprised and said, well, it didn't cost me anything, Pastor said, okay, if it didn't cost you anything to ride it, how much did it cost you to put in the lift? He said, I didn't pay to have the lift put in. And the pastor said, well, then why do you trust it? If you didn't pay to ride it, if you didn't pay to have it put in, why do you trust that it's safe? It's too cheap, isn't it? And the miner said, no, pastor, I didn't pay to put it in. The company paid to, oh. And that's when the light bulb went off and the miner understood what the pastor was trying to tell him. It didn't cost him anything to ride on that lift, but it cost the company a lot of money to put it in. It doesn't cost us anything to go through the narrow door, but it cost Jesus everything through his death and resurrection, to save us from our sins. That's why the door is open. And here's the thing that we remember. The door is open and there will be many people in the kingdom. Jesus himself even said it. Even after he talks about the narrow door, did you see what he said? People will come from all directions, north, south, east, and west, gathering together in the kingdom 
It's a repeat of what we heard in the reading from Isaiah about people gathering from all over, coming to worship the Lord in his kingdom. The door may be narrow, but it's not shut. The way has been opened through Jesus' death and resurrection so that we can go through just because the door is opened by Christ doesn't mean that we're off the hook. This is not an invitation to relax. When you hear this, you can't say, well, there's nothing left to do. Wonder what's on TV. I heard that Good Place show is cool. Just because God opened the door for us doesn't mean that we're off the hook. For good works. Let me put it to you this way. I heard this at a national youth gathering once. It kind of rocked me back, but the more I thought about it, the more I liked it. The presenter got up and asked us a question, a pointed question in a Lutheran gathering, and that's this. Are good works necessary? And you know how we all answered? No. Because that's a good Lutheran answer, right? And he looked at us and said, you're wrong. And a bunch of the pastors there started getting up in arms and we started getting ready for a fight. He said, no, wait, 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 let me ask you this question. Are good works necessary for salvation? And we said, no. Are good works necessary? And the answer is yes. The Bible makes that clear. But we have to understand what that means. Good works aren't necessary to get us through the door. Good works aren't necessary to win us our spot in heaven. But God still calls on his people to do good works, not to save us, but because we've already been saved. Not to win for our salvation, but to respond to our salvation. It's like what I said a couple of weeks ago. God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbors do. Now that we have gone through the narrow door of Christ himself, Jesus calls on us to serve our neighbors with our good works, not to save ourselves, but as a way of responding to his free and incredible grace. And so may we go through that, good do that narrow door. May we respond to God's grace with good works. May we show people who we belong to through what we do. Amen? Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor John. I think that's a great, great uh, reminder, too, that so often we get bent out of shape of things in the Scripture, like you were saying early on. And then when we start to look at what Jesus is up to, we always realize Jesus' way really is maybe the best way. Absolutely. So Absolutely. thank you for that today. Well, may God continue to bless you as you contemplate these words today, the Scriptures we heard today, the reception of God's gifts today. We're going to go out and joy and song this morning as we go out as God's people. So I do invite you to please rise as our musicians step up as we're going to sing on our way out. And may God bless you today.
never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. today knowing even when you don't see it God is at work among us go in peace